I'm going to pass things over to uh, my colleague Jessica Whipple at Emergent Tech and Kelly Krasinowski from BC Ministry of the Environment to lead us through this session for on communication challenges of remote locations. Um, I know a lot of folks have been looking forward to this. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear us okay? Thank you. Um, as Meg said, my name is Jessica Whipple with Emergent Tech, and I'm joined here by Kelly, who was uh, given a wonderful presentation earlier. In the interest of time, we're going to try and uh, hustle through our introductions here, but I wanted to introduce in person with us, we have uh, Liam Devine. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you. Um, Liam Devine, Emergency Planning Analyst with the Government of British Columbia. And I will attest, this is my first time on trial, so um, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. And we've got Lieutenant Commander Megan Boas. Hello, I'm Megan Bowes with U.S. Coast Guard Pacific Area. I'm the Incident Management Section Chief, so I oversee all incident responses to include maritime, uh, maritime environmental response, search and rescue, uh, disaster response, and, and we cover Hollywood to Bollywood, penguins to polar bears, all the remote places in between, and comms is always an issue. That's an excellent elevator pitch. I like that. All right, and then online, we've got Derek Moss. You want to introduce yourself, Derek? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Derek Moss, I'm the Assistant Commissioner for the Canadian Coast Guard Western Region. Um, and uh, just for Megan, I recognize that line from Admiral Johnson, so keep on saying it. I love it. And we've got Michael Anderson. Afternoon, everybody. Michael Anderson. I'm an issues and crisis consultant, and that includes supporting uh, PIO and uh, LOFR positions during an incident command. Thank you. And last but not least, Melinda Brunner. Good afternoon, folks. I'm Melinda Brunner with the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation Prevention, Preparedness, and Response Program. And I am joining you from Fairbanks, Alaska. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. This is our last session of the day, and we're going to be talking about communication challenges of remote locations. Um, so I'll just give you the overview here. Remote locations provide unique challenges for spill responders. This session will explore the safety and communication needs when working in physical or technologically remote areas and the tools used to address these constraints. So as I mentioned, um, we're going to keep moving along here and try and get uh, make sure that there's still room for some Q&A at the end, because I think there's going to be some really good questions on this topic. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand off, I know we've got a couple of brief presentations online. So Derek, I'm gonna actually have you go first. And Anna, can we um, make sure that he's got all the control he needs there? I think I do, I guess I didn't prepare slides. So as yeah, long as everyone can hear me, I think we're okay. You're good uh, to so go. Jessica, Kelly, thank you very much for organizing this. Fellow panelists, uh, conference participants, I'm gonna scream through this because um, I, I had a somewhat lengthy talk, but I'm going to shorten it significantly. Uh, and I think there'll be more meat in the questions and answers. So when I look at um, remote uh, or co communications in remote areas, uh, first of all, I categorize it into two types of operations, a deliberate or an urgent. Um, and I'll give a very brief example on each. The General Zelensky is a U.S. Army transport that sank in Grenfell Channel, northern B.C. in 1946. In 2003, slow drips of oil uh, started to rise to the surface. And in 2013, the Canadian Coast Guard embarked on a major operation to remediate the vessel and get as much um, hydrocarbons out of it as possible. Uh, so that was months and months and months in the planning, uh, which meant for, from a communications perspective, we, we were able to occupy a community hall, um, rig communications throughout it, spent about uh, a full month uh, making sure that we had good connectivity between our community hall in Prince Rupert, British Columbia, and the actual site and the on-scene uh, operators of the General Zelensky who were 50, 60 miles away in a very remote area. Um, that worked really well. We've also done very similar operations and exercises uh, in, the, in the Arctic. I'm sure Melinda is very familiar with that. Um, so operating out of a lot of remote communities, if you have the time, you build up your communications infrastructure before you go. Of course, you're not always afforded time and then you have an urgent operation. Uh, and I hearken back to 2016, um, off a community called Bella Bella, the Nathan E. Stewart, a tug pushing a fuel barge ran aground. 
Um, obviously, no warning for that. Uh, so then you have an urgent response and you're showing up at the site with whatever you can bring. Um, so that is obviously not as robust as a deliberate operation, but you get to mitigate that. And I'll talk about that um, with some of the technology mitigation factors uh, that we put in play. Um, so aside from urgent and deliberate operations, from a communications perspective, I've kind of divided it up into three different categories uh, and safety as well, I should add, environment, technology, and local knowledge. Uh, so environment's the easiest to talk about. It's something we can all relate to. Um, you're operating in the cold, the wet, the snow perhaps, could be a mountainous area which affects communications, probably no road access in a lot of areas. Depending on the time of year and the latitude, it could be dark for a good chunk of day, lack of accommodations and resupply capability, surface weather and currents affecting dive operations and ROV operations. Um, drones and uncrewed vessels or vehicles are very valuable in this type of operation and in most type of operations. Your bottom mapping is going to be uh, a little dicey. Um, and the more the, the more remote the area, the more pristine it is and therefore subject to closer public scrutiny um, because we obviously don't want to affect the areas that have been pristine for generation upon generation. Um, and also from a safety perspective, of course, with the environment, um, medevac capability. So having a helicopter, having a uh, medical capability on site is very advantageous. Shifting very quickly to technology, um, so the Canadian Coast Guard has invested heavily into mobile incident command posts. Um, so they come in a variety of forms. Um, it could be a full um, sea container um, that you would literally have to put on an 18-wheeler or put on a ship. Um, there are smaller packages available that you can tow from a, from a truck. Uh, and what that gives you, the mobile incident command post, is typically satellite communication for internet, VHF and UHF comms. Um, you bring portable radios with that deployable repeaters so that from your headquarters site or incident command post or unified command, you're able to talk to the folks uh, actually conducting the operation on site. Um, remote connectivity tests, uh, kits, uh, and then of course, a whole bunch of uh, good gear from ROV, ROVs, drones, bottom mapping software, et cetera. So having a ready to go um, satellite subscription, the Canadian Coast Guard right now using Starlink for most of our needs, uh, that can be quickly enhanced so you can um, you basically buy as, as much bandwidth as you need. Um, we use, uh, from a technological perspective, uh, a system called Trello. Um, it's used in the tech sector as a Kanban board, um, and it's very, very easy for us to then communicate with other government departments, uh, whether at the federal level, provincial level, with First Nations communities, Indigenous communities up and down the coast. And just, just as a matter of uh, record, um, I, I will be saying First Nations. Canada has three Indigenous groups, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. But from a British Columbia perspective, it's only uh, First Nations communities that are up and down the coast. So Trello, we found uh, particularly uh, adept, and I know the U.S. Coast Guard is digging into that and trialing it as well. Uh, local knowledge. Uh, so I'll jump very quickly into this. Uh, and I, I was very interested to hear some of the questions about uh, working with Indigenous communities um, and really you know, listening to that local knowledge. And I, I use the term listening uh, with purpose because all too often we tend to use it as a, a tick in the box. Yes, I've, I've consulted and then we move on and we haven't really heard what's been said. Um, the Canadian Coast Guard has made mistakes in the past. Uh, in that category, um, we like to think that we've improved the relationships significantly in the past eight to 10 years. Um, the Nathan E. Stewart and Bella Bella was a wonderful example. Although we included the HealthSec Nation into the de decision making, the spill response unified command um, from the very beginning, um, my, my impression now looking back is that was somewhat perfunctory. Um, and not reflective of our partnership, um, and again, I use that word very deliberately, that we have with First Nations today, where it is equal na nation to nation, uh, partner to partner talk, and the information we get is absolutely valuable. And then we, when we lay out plans, they're not laid out, they're worked on together um, with the First Nation uh, to come up with a, uh, a mutually beneficial solution. 
for the first time, um, so from a local knowledge perspective, for the first time this year, I co-signed an after action report um, with uh, First Nations Chief, Chief Jerry Jack. Um, that was for Bly, uh, Bly Island remediation we did, and he was in unified command every single day for about three months. Um, for the General Zelensky, which is the one I'd mentioned that we remediated in 2013, uh, turns out it wasn't fully remediated, so we're uh, doing a deliberate operation to go back there. And again, it's the first time that the remediation plan was worked on uh, by the incident commander from the First Nation, the Get Get First Nation, and the incident commander from the Canadian Coast Guard. So plenty of firsts. Um, taking advantage of local knowledge in uh, in remote areas is absolutely, absolutely critical. And I do take the strong points that I heard with the last panelists and questions that um, you can't surge trust. This is not something that you can do at the last minute um, when a vessel is leaking oil into the environment. The effort needs to be uh, made up front. Uh, and those initial meetings, in my opinion, um, don't come in with an agenda. Come in to listen, come in to build relationships and, and build it from there. That was fast and furious. So I'll uh, leave it there out of respect to my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you fitting in so much valuable information in a short period of time. Um, let's go ahead and hand off to Melinda. I think you've got a couple of slides prepared for us today. I do. Are you folks able to put those up? Or am I putting them up? I think that they'll take care of that for you here in the room. One moment. Sure. Oh, great. So earlier in the day, Tiffany Larson, the SPAR director, had mentioned that I was going to include this slide that shows the, the size of Alaska. So this presentation talks about the communication challenges that Alaska faces based on the size, the weather, and had I known I was gonna be going after the Canadians, I would have perhaps tailored the message a little bit differently. However, um, if you take a look, Alaska, one fifth the size of the US, um, 2000 miles from our capital in Juneau out to the farthest west island of Attu, over a thousand miles from top to bottom, uh, 6,000 plus miles of coastline, and that grows to over 30,000 miles when we start talking about, uh, start including islands. And just incredibly varied. Southeast Alaska has rainforests, and then the Kobuk Valley National Park up above the Arctic Circle has over 30 square miles of desert sand dunes. So depending on where we are in Alaska, the type of response and, and how far you are from the nearest community is going to be varied. Next slide, please. So this map of Alaska shows you the infrastructure that we have, which as you can tell from the limited uh, colored lines, we don't have a lot of. The red there is our highways um, and the blues are ferry systems. We do have a, a railroad, which is that dotted orange line, but it's, it's, it doesn't cover much of the state. Um, and then you might ask yourself about uh, airports. We have over 400 public airports in the state, um, 280 some land-based, and then four heliports and 114 sea-based seaplane bases. So we do have a lot of airports and places to land around the state, but again, infrastructure is limited. Um, and along with those, transportation limitations, I'll call them. We also have other infrastructure limitations that impact response and our ability to, to deal with spills, including cell coverage, uh, electricity, running water, um, and hospitals. Next slide, please. So what is the state of Alaska using for, for communication in, that we have? Uh, ready to take with us whenever we're headed out. Um, we have the Alaska Land Mobile Radio System. Um, our responders have cell phones and sat phones and also mobile hotspots that they will take with them. And finally, uh, personal locator beacons just as a last safety measure. Next slide, please. So our Alaska mobile radio coverage is the 
pink bubbles that you'll see there. The system was built primarily by the Department of Defense um, to help with the, I'm sorry, the defense support of civilian authorities. In 2013, DOD handed that system over to the state of Alaska. So we have um, set permanent repeaters. You'll see are those yellow triangles in the left-hand map um, up and down primarily the road system with the exception of the yellow triangle you see in Southeast, which is in Juneau. Um, and then we, DEC, have a number of portable repeaters that we can take with us and then a approximately 160 handheld units at this time. So the, the function of those handheld units and mobile units is that within that uh, corridor of pink, someone in Juneau, for example, can talk to someone in Fairbanks on a response as long as they are both within those areas of pink. The other use that we, can, that we have for those systems is if we take a mobile repeater with us and we take our handhelds, we can set up a line of sight communication system. The range is about 20 to 40 miles, depending on, again, line of sight, um, enabling us to talk even if like there's not cell phone coverage, that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is cell phone coverage. Oh, question? No? This is cell phone coverage in Alaska. These are three of our carriers, Verizon, GCI, and AT&T. Um, you'll notice that there is a lot of white across Alaska without, um, without any sort of cell phone coverage. Um, and depending on where you live, your carrier may not, um, may not cover you when you are elsewhere. So for example, my responders, depending on where they are based out of and or where they are going to be responding, like my Western uh, Western Alaska unit, they have GCI coverage on their work cell phones as opposed to AT&T or Verizon because that's where they are, are going to be responding. But again, it's patchy. It is patchy. Next slide, please. So some of the communication issues that we already touched on, it's patchy. It's so patchy. Um, there are training issues as we move from, well, and we've talked about it multiple times over the last day about staffing and about changes in technology. So both of those things can lead to training challenges to make sure people know how to use what it is we're giving them as they head out the door. Um, planning for compatibility, old technology and new technology has difficulties talking to each other. And then there's also issues with talking between uh, the, the, the units used by the various entities. Coast Guard, for example, we have an M, um, memorandum of understanding with them so that they are um, dialed in on the channels on our Alaska land mobile radio covered system rather, so that we can all understand what the protocol is, is, is and what channels we're gonna be using. And then, just some of the difficulties of, again, living in Alaska, it is cold, it is dark, and with the cold comes the struggle sometimes to keep, to find electricity to charge things. So often we need to take generators with us. And then if it is cold, sometimes that's a real challenge to get things charged and have them stay functional when we are out in the field. And then new options coming along. Uh, things are always changing. I, uh, I heard the mention of Starlink with the, um, that the Canadians are using. The state of Alaska is not currently, but we have seen um, Starlink most recently anecdotally out in Circle this spring during the flood responses. A local community member had Starlink and they ended up being able to um, set up internet connectivity for the community at the local community center based on the Starlink, even though the local um, cell phone coverage companies were not functioning there at that time. So I would love to hear more about Starlink and the reliability of that. Um, other things that we've seen out in the field, um, uh, cell towers on wheels, like during Selendag IU, if it's a long enough response, we've seen 
those sorts of things rolled out uh, to set up, you know, a basic, eh, what turned out to be a, like a ship phone booth where this cell phone tower, mobile cell phone tower was set up. And then, you know, that is used on a, now it's your turn to get into the cell tower spot and report out kind of uh, process. So we are also very aware of technology changing our own Alaska mobile radio system. Like we are in the process of replacing those radios. As technology changes, they are becoming um, obsolete. We currently have about 120 older handheld units and 40 newer ones. Um, and we will be replacing out the older ones as we go. It's an expensive process. Each of those handhelds is about $5,500. So that is the extent of what we have in hand. And I think that's my last side slide. Next slide. Yeah, questions. All right, I'm actually gonna ask um, questions. We're gonna hold till the end here. And I promise that we will get to some Melinda because I think there'll be some great questions for you, especially with that spotty map of Alaska. I think you've got some, some good, uh, good challenges up there that people will wanna talk about. Um, we're gonna go ahead and hand off to Michael Anderson. I think that we've got some slides for you as well. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I kind of took the position of let's talk about some case studies uh, that are a little different, a, a little bit more remote, but fairly recent, and, and kind of look at how they were we dealt with remote challenges in different types of response, but it really ladders up very well into what you would be doing in an oil spill response scenario. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's start with Hurricane Maria. Uh, 2017 was a heck of a year for hurricanes uh, in the Caribbean, and Puerto Rico seemed like it was the farthest place away in the entire world. Um, interestingly enough, one of the initial communications challenges coming into Hurricane Maria wasn't actually on the island. It was you had 3, 3 million people on the island, but you had 5 million people with connections stateside that were scrambling for information to get in touch with people on the island. In that, they were making phone calls and the Federal Authority of Puerto Rico's call center dropped and they had to put up a voicemail because there was such an influx of calls and phone numbers were being shared broadly across uh, social media for Coast Guard command centers and other command center response command centers that were responding to the hurricane and getting in position. In fact, Sector Key West just got on its feet following Irma and all of a sudden they got deluged with calls because their command center phone number was shared online and they instantly went back offline. And uh, at the district office in Miami was also facing similar situations. Uh, next slide, please. So going into this, you've got the response happening at a distal location, nearly a thousand miles away. You've got responders vectoring in, going down towards that. You've got potential loss of life, property, you've got hazardous materials, uh, in the environment. And so one of the first things you need to understand is get people down as fast as you can for imagery. One of the biggest things people want to see is they want to see and, and see what's going on, see what's happening. And so you can use your response personnel to see if they can send photos back. You know, they're probably most likely taking pictures when they're out there surveying and seeing what's going on. And that can be a quick way to get imagery out to the media and to the public so they understand what's going on. Specifically for Maria, we also did targeted social media posts, not in the affected area because they were wiped out. They had no social media on the island following uh, landfall. It was targeting social media posts where you had large concentrations of stateside Puerto Ricans so that you could tell them there's response operations were happening, that they were informed that, that this is what was going on and they could potentially see their loved ones because we were pulling up uh, imagery from the first responders and throwing it on social media. And that was then also as a weird conflux with that, we were getting reports of injured people and, and hazardous material releases from 
people outside the affected area. So you had people calling from New York, California, Florida, saying, hey, listen, we have injured people here. Hey, you have some kind of material over here. It's dangerous. And when they could get intermittent connectivity, they were not calling first responders. They were calling their friends and family stateside. And, and so you started seeing that being an input from there. Also, in, in the wake of that, rumor control. Uh, we had to scrape social media constantly looking for phone numbers linked to command centers and operational units and redirect them to the right locations. And it was amazing. We would actually hear from the command centers running the response. They'd be like, oh my God, we're getting inundated by calls. We do a scrape of social media, find out who was posting that misinformation, go after them, flip the phone number, and almost immediately all the calls would die down as they were routed to the right uh, POC. Next slide, please. So with that, in Maria, we were learning on the fly about the communities and tailoring our messaging for the communities that are providing information to us, especially the affected areas, uh, uh, the people with effect, uh, outside of the affected area that we're trying to reach in. We were also making touch points through the search and rescue missions on how we can engage with those communities and that better helped us get into the environmental response later on. We created beacons of information through imagery and social media. So the picture right there is of a, a guy named Dick and that we were having our first responders who were bringing water and supplies in at various locations around the island, take as many pictures as they could, especially if there were civilians there in the area. And this is one of the images. And if you notice on the comments, they're like, oh my God, there's Dick. So through that, they were actually finding out the status of their loved ones on the island. We also had a case where we had multiple reports. And so what was coming into the JIC were multiple reports of situations that were going on around the island. Uh, one of them that we ended up getting about 15 reports about was a elderly woman who had um, been near a window that when the hurricane hit and it blew out through glass all over her and she was injured and in need of care. Based on being able to aggregate enough information from those reports, we actually were able to get a boat crew over there. And yes, there was an elderly woman who was injured and she got evac and safely out through the reports we took on social media. With that, we build up credibility through our life-saving operations. What you're going to see a lot of times is that initially, uh, there's a good chance that some type of natural disaster or something will trigger a, a release. And depending on how the government does in that initial response, we'll set the tone for how cleanup operations are potentially perceived as a starting point. With that, we also had a facilitation of information throughout the public and the response. We were taking information from the public state side, shift, sifting through it, and getting it over to the response elements, and so they could do operations there. And, and we helped facilitate that uh, flow of information. All right, next slide, please. So I do consulting for both uh, government and uh, corporate agencies. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, I, I was working for a, a food plant in one of the most remote areas in the country. The nearest tier one medical center was four hours away. So if people were getting sick uh, during the pandemic, they were a very, very long way away. Also, as an interesting thing, there were 37 different languages spoken at this plant. You know, you're starting to see that through some of the earlier presenters about 150 languages in Texas, multiple different languages in uh, Alaska, and you're seeing more and more different languages being spoke in industry, especially fishing, food processing, and agriculture. And so when those people are affected, you really have to be able to go in and find ways to meet a minimum standard of communication to all those stakeholder groups. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> again, it goes back to the imagery. Uh, where you really want to start at a remote situation is inside imagery, information, or getting information at all. Most of the time, the reporters are either going to be bunkered down or outside the affected area, and they're not going to be able to get the story out. So it's going to be incumbent on the first responders and the people involved inside the response to get that initial blast of information out. This is really, really important in that 
it sets up you as the source of information. And that helps set the tone for how the public is perceiving the response. Engaged stakeholders. One of the things we saw inside this plant is that there were existing engagement patterns already existing inside the community. Uh, and so where there were leader groups based on uh, demographic breaks, you know, countries of origin, language, we, instead of fighting against that and trying to create new patterns that work for the response, we tapped into those groups and those leaders and said, hey, listen, we're gonna use you to spread the word for us in this community. That being said, this also applies to remote areas where you might have isolated people and maybe they go to one store, one trading post or one place to pick up their mail, or they have gathering points or flow points. And how do you use those to get the information out because they might not have access to electronic social media, satellite phones, et cetera. Uh, language considerations. So one of the interesting things we did is as you're seeing all these different languages in these little remote areas is we actually, we couldn't get a uh, language translation service for one in particular, I remember that we were told 5,000 people speak it in the entire world and there was no way we were gonna get a translator to help communicate that information out. And so uh, we were struggling with that because you know we needed to make sure everybody at that plant knew what were the dangers, what they needed to do, how they needed to be safe and what was going on. And so what we did was we gathered up all of the street signs from all of the countries and, and all of the languages of where everyone came from that worked at that plant. And through that, we aggregated pictographs and signs with no language that would align with those so that anybody could look at it and say, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. And, and that's one of the ways we broke through the language barrier because it was such a challenge. Uh, with that physical visuals, not always will they have uh, ways to see your content online, your electronics, anything like that. And so with that, we, we put up street signs, uh, the flashing lights at various points through the community. We looked at flying banners and ham radio operators, and we really dug in on ways we can use the community to help spread the word. Because more often than not, these communities have ways to communicate in these remote areas. And then the, the last little bit, and this is really important, is appearance really is reality when, when you get into these responses. And if most people will come in with a preset situation on the way they think things should be or who's at fault. And so you really have to understand that preload against that and, and message to make sure that the response is doing the right thing. You're connecting with the right communities and, and you're taking it to a place where everybody feels like they're being taken care of. Uh, next slide. So with what we did, we actually prioritized the stakeholders that were most relevant. We got the information they needed and, and staggered out from there. During the response, there was a lot of attention focused on uh, food processing plants for a various time. And so we, we didn't worry about what we were doing. We dug in locally with the local government, with the local health department, and what you saw in other responses from similar industries was that something would happen at the plant. And the first people to actually criticize the plant was the mayor and the local health department. Because of the work we did, the engagement we did, they were actually saying, hey, this is the right, right way to do this. This is what's going on. And we set up webinars with the mayor and the city hall. And we did various things to make sure that the local government was really dialed in. And that's something very important uh, for everything you do in oil spill response, just because of the way our construct is structured. With that, you also have engagement points locally uh, with companies with in, in, uh, and communities. So if you have an officer or somebody who works in an area or travels through an area and they make a face, use them to be a bridge to get into talking to that community and seeing what they can do. Uh, because, you know, a lot of people live in the middle of nowhere because they don't want to be around people or because they have to for work. And so if you can find a way to reach in and find out where those people are, it really helps. And the second thing is engage those people with transparency and build trust. Because if you don't, it's going to come back and bite you. Uh, 
a lot of companies and a, a lot of agencies weren't giving out good numbers. Uh, they wouldn't talk about how many people got sick, what, what was the downed workforce, what was going on. And we leaned into that and actually shared that information very broadly with the people involved at this small little plant in the middle of nowhere. And it helped build trust and diffuse criticism because when the New York Times blew through uh, towards the end of the, that month, they actually were talking to people in town and, and somebody told the reporter, actually, you know, it might be coming from the plane, it might be coming from us. We don't know. But all I know is they're doing all this right stuff and taking care of everybody. And so that transparency, that trust, getting the information out there and, and talking to people to build that support is very important. Uh, next slide. With that, I want to leave you with just a couple of things. Uh, when you're going into a remote area, you're thinking, oh, this is disjointed and diffuse and there's people all over and, and we're really having to micro target and figure out ways to get banners and placards and reach out in very local ways. I would say that's what you should be doing for all responses right now, because if you look at our media environment, it is now disjointed, diffuse. People are not going to flip on Walter Cronkite at night or going to one news station or newspaper for their information. They're pulling it from all over the web. And so you need to be ready for that. And so you really need to be going into tailoring your responses and communication efforts to support that. Uh, finding the avenues to visually show what's happening it is always the great way to start that initial kickoff because people want to see what's going on. You can write about it all day long, but that putting it out there so they can see was really important. One of the things we did is they were cleaning the plant and we threw out soapy water shows of them scrubbing the plant. Nobody in it, just it covered in soap and water as they were cleaning it. And, and that was one of the ways we showed that they were really taking time to clean what was going, uh, take care of the plant and take care of people. Uh, we leveraged the existing stakeholders. You know, don't try to recreate the wheel. Don't try to do something new. Don't try to do a frog splash into a community expecting them to jump to. Look for places where there is an intermediary that can help support. Look for that third party support to build that connection in. When you're looking at minimal ability to gauge everybody, and if you're doing it through pictographs, through communication, through spokespeople, through stakeholder groups, whatever you need to do to get that done, get your kit together. And I've heard everybody talk about satellite phones with DSN, solar chargers, MREs. When you're sending somebody down range as a PI on loafer, you still need all that stuff. And you should be self-compartmentalized and able to do it by yourself. I've been in uh, situations where I'm hunting for a FEMA trailer with a connection to get some imagery out and it doesn't work. You, if you're going to send somebody down there, you need to make sure they have the infrastructure to do what they need to do and get information out. And the last little bit is when you're remote on a response, reporters are going to be wanting in the helicopter on that boat. They're going to be want, trying to do everything they can to get out there to get their own imagery. So when you get to that point, facilitate it as much as you can. It'll pay dividends. It'll show you're open, transparent, you're getting people where they need and they will appreciate it because their newsroom is harping on them to get out there and get imagery. And if you support that, it will help build that relationship and, and you can actually get a better consideration if you're facilitating their trips uh, to the response area. Next slide. And that's it for me. I, I tried to blaze through it. I hope that wasn't too fast for everybody. Thank you so much for that, Michael. That was an uh, excellent presentation on crisis communications. So we're going to shift gears a, a wee bit here, and we're going to ask um, a couple of folks here on our panel a, a question. So over to uh, Lieutenant Commander Bowis and to Liam. A qu the question is, what are the most effective tools and technologies you have used or recommend for communication in remote locations? How do you overcome the technical or logistic difficulties of using them. So a bit of a double-barreled question, the effective tools and technologies, and how do you overcome the technical log or logistical difficulties? <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm actually going to start off with a quote. Um, so in, in response or in an ICS structure, uh, communications is under logistics, right? Your, your comm is under logistics. And so the quote I have is from Napoleon, the amateurs discuss tactics, the professionals just discuss logistics. With that said, 
I am a tactics person and I, my husband and my people work for me are logistics people. And so I am hundred percent reliant on those people to school me on, on how to use equipment, how to get to get what I need to execute those tactics. Um, and, and so some of those, those things I've learned along the way, um, really the tools that we have in our pocket too. And in Coast Guard, we, we really emphasize uh, risk management and part of that assessment of risk management is communications. And so how, how do you get the right equipment for where you're going, what you need? And, and those tools could be, um, as far as our back pocket here, we have a lot of infrastructure throughout the United States with uh, Rescue 21, uh, high frequency VHF, UHF type towers. Um, and where we struggle is in those geographic, beautiful locations, high latitudes that, that uh, were talked about already. Um, so to, and then also a huge, larger reliance on cell phones uh, and social media. And, and we don't have the tools to monitor cell phone and social media communications. Um, so kind of relying on radios uh, as kind of old school on our end. Uh, we have a communications command. It has a bunch of smart people there that I like to tap into. Um, and then we have, um, for responses, uh, we have the enhanced mobile incident command post, not just the incident command post, but it's a mobile incident command post that comes with a bunch of a communications equipment and people who know how to use it. Um, and it'll help you set it all up. Um, that's part of one of our response uh, capabilities here. Um, they also, we also have access to plum kits, uh, satellite communications, Starlink, we're starting to dabble in with that. Um, and then many of you are familiar with the National Strike Force and their deployable capabilities. We have a communications team that's similar. They're the deployable communication forces. Um, so we have a special, special trained communications team that can come help us out. Um, and so those are really kind of the big things that I've taken away in, in my lack of understanding of these logistics and communications as a tactics type person. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm married to a retired Coastie that was a regional director of fleet and I'm a heavy duty planner. So I can understand how these are, you know, matches that are very nicely made, very uh, mutually beneficial. So uh, over to you, Liam. Sure, thank you. Um, tactical amateur, maybe I should start calling myself that as well. Um, yeah, this is a super interesting uh, conversation. Um, I, coincidentally, I'm the information officer for our program. Um, in preparation for this, I was really set on the operational um, side of remote communications. But now that I've seen it's it's um, the breadth of the uh, the topics much wider than that with communications experts, um, how we get our messages out to the public, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, but for our program, we rely, um, I would say, uh, on some of the more traditional forms of um, communication uh, devices, things like satellite phones that's already been mentioned. One, one area of uh, maybe, um, technology that we have pushed through in the uh, the last couple years here has been um, newer newer forms of um, communication devices called inreach that we've deployed out to our team we have 26 of those it pales in comparison to i think alaska's with had 160 handheld units that was mentioned but um, nevertheless um, they provide us with fantastic two-way communication capability uh, you're able to send text messages, um, SOS, that sort of thing. Um, we also have really well-defined processes and protocols for safety in our program with the geography that we work in, um, well-being check-in procedures, field level hazard assessments, um, safe work and fatigue management, believe it or not. When you're driving all night on some of the icy uh, mountainous roads that we have in British Columbia with the mountain passes and um, yeah, it's uh, your eyes can start playing tricks on you, I guess. Yeah. And uh, so we're really big with um, folks taking breaks when they need to. Um, uh, and then um, part of the safety measures in our province 
re regarding communication on response on a spill response um, that that provides us with an extra layer of um, of safety is a provincial forestry radio system um, that we utilize from the BC Wildfire Service. Um, there ha there's a number of radio towers in really, really remote areas of the province um, of BC um, that provide us with the ability to pretty much SOS um, if, if one of our response officers or staff is in trouble. And uh, that covers 85% of the province, which um, is pretty extensive when considering uh, the, just the size of, of BC. So um, I think I'll leave it at that for now. And uh, yeah. Great, thank you very much, Liam. And so over to, the, to those um, who are on the phone, is there anything you would like to add just about the effective tools and technologies and how do you overcome the technical and logistical difficulties? How about my friend in the uh, Canadian Coast Guard, Derek? I'm sure I, I have a, a specific example that's um, unique to the Canadian Coast Guard. So we're putting together what's called a communication portal for integrated incident response or CEPR. Um, so it's, it's an information sharing uh, and collaborative tool. Uh, between the Canadian Coast Guard, Indigenous communities, and other response partners. And it, it came uh, into fruition from responses to oil spills in First Nations communities in the 2013 to 2016 timeframe. Um, so it does incorporate uh, parts of uh, the incident command system, but it's more of a case management rather than incident management. And I'll use a specific example um, to, to sort of explain what I'm trying to articulate. So Zim Kingston was a container ship. Um, so some of you may have heard about it. Uh, October 21st, uh, 2021, it was circling off the Straits of Juan de Fuca off the coast of British Columbia, um, waiting for a berth. The supply chain backlog forced a bunch of ships to be uh, doing circles off the coast of British Columbia, very similar to what uh, the United States saw down off of Long Beach. Uh, and a, uh, a weather bomb hit, um, a, a bunch of unfortunate events, and the ship lost 109 containers overboard, um, then started sailing in to go to anchor off of Victoria. One of the breached containers that was still on board took in water, which reacted very poorly with the potassium on board uh, and caught the vessel on fire. Um, so seems like kind of a logical sequence of emergencies, uh, but from a communications and incident command system point of view, it was very frustrating to manage because you had an environmental response team who were handling the first part of the incident with the containers. Then you had the Joint Rescue Coordination Center um, who were trying to get everyone off, off the ship, saving life and limb, while the environmental response people were saying the exact opposite to the crew. No, no, you've got to stay on and put out that fire. Um, so rather than incident management, we started looking at case management. Um, and the uh, the CEPR system is something we're trialing right now. We've brought it out with four, four, uh, four First Nations um, and really let them develop it. Um, and work with us. So they've got their incident commanders, their IT specialists, um, and it's to keep them informed as to what's going on off their communities, off their waters, um, to keep their livelihood intact and, and create better situational awareness. So a very broad uh, description of a tool that's specifically meant to uh, share information, not only amongst uh, response partners, but First Nation responders and communities as well. All right, thank you. Um, I think we got some really good information there. And I do know that the topic of Starlink has come up. Um, so I have a feeling that'll come up when you guys start asking questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and move. We'll do one more question. I know that we're a little bit over. So for anyone online, if you need to hop off, that is totally okay. I just think that there's um, been an expressed interest in this topic. So we're gonna ask one more question from the panel and then we'll hand off to you guys to ask your questions. Um, so our next question, and this is for the whole group, so if any of our panelists want to jump in and, and answer this one, how do you train and prepare your response team and local community for the communication challenges of a remote location? So this is going back to preparation. So I'm going to ask if any of the panelists want to jump in and speak to this one, training and preparation. I'll 
I'll jump in on that one. Um, for the Coast Guard, a lot of our uh, outreach is towards is preventative in nature, uh, teaching the community how to uh, communicate and have the correct safety gear so they can communicate when they're in a, a distress situation. And, and that is, you know, largely by us reaching out through our auxiliaries or our volunteer corps that uh, will, you know, do courtesy inspections on vessels, do public education and outreach on, on what systems work and, and communicate with ours as far as, as, far as communicating. Um, and then phone numbers to call if necessary, like, like if there is an oil spill, how do you report it is huge notification being probably the most important, one of the most important things in a spill response. Um, and then, um, for, for just how to use your equipment and, and stuff like that. So you, we can prevent loss of life and save property. Yeah, and I'll just add briefly for the BC government, um, we are regularly involved in training exercises. Um, both internally and with our uh, our federal partners and with within industry, um, so we um, we practice and train on um, communications um, regularly. We also have a policy um, for our new environmental emergency response officers that um, they have to have been working with us for six months before they can take over. Um, a response and, and lead it. And so there's quite a bit of mentoring and um, support that happens there just with the complexity of some of the, um, the spills that we do attend to. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you. Thanks. Anything from anyone online? I would also say media monitoring. You, you want to know what everybody's talking about, where they are. Yes, you want to make connections, but you want to see how they're consuming information. Who are thought leaders in the community? What uh, what resonates in the community, how they feel on certain topics. And if you're media monitoring in a very effective way, you're going to get word clouds around certain topics. So you can actually say, okay, this is how they feel about oil spill response. This is how they feel about environmental. This is how they feel about the government. And you can actually pre-lock and load what's going on. And if you're really savvy, then you start planning stories leading into the response to actually manipulate that word cloud. So you actually are planning the right information leading into the response. So there's a lot of work there on social media with predictive AI and analytics that you can actually do so you can map the entire ecosystem so you're not going in blind. Michael, I'm putting you on speed dial. <laughs> um, I can offer a couple of quick thoughts uh, before we go to uh, the attendees for their questions. Um, so you'll walk before you run. I think this is intuitive to everybody. Um, so as the organization responsible for um, at sea spills from ships and mystery sources, so the Canadian Coast Guard, we have our individual skills training. Um, then you build on that. You do unit training, multiple unit training, cross organizational training, international training and exercises, et cetera, et cetera. So those are, are mandated. You've got to have them written down. You have to respect them because it's far too easy to get lost in the, uh, the mayhem of operations and forget about training uh, and exercising. Similarly, um, we see great initiative from oil companies, from the oil industry, for example, who hold um, a series of exercises across uh, the country um, because they, they have a responsibility uh, to participate and to show their competence in oil spill response. And of course, that flows over into the response organizations themselves, um, probably something similar in, in the United States, although I can't speak to that. But in Canada, um, the response organizations are accountable to Transport Canada uh, for passing an exercise of so many uh, uh, simulated so many tons spill. I think it's uh, 10,000 ton or something like that. So the whole community knows that you have to train and exercise. Um, and now we're actually doing the train the trainer um, work in local communities. So the First Nations get their people qualified as trainers, take that experience back um, so that they're the first responders, not only for environmental response, but also search and rescue. And that's just paying off dividends every day. Melinda, do you want to add anything? Yeah, let me touch on just a little bit. I, I would echo the the folks that said they have training programs. We The state of Alaska has internal training programs for communication for our staff on equipment and messaging before they go out into the field. 
We also have participate in exercises, both um, exercises that we call people to do and exercises that industry and regulated entities are, are you know, driving and we are overseeing. Um, in terms of community communication and, and training, I would put it more in terms of we are flexible and constantly looking for um, a community specific way that is best to reach them. Alaska is unique in what a given community might be using to disseminate knowledge. So you might find us using local radio or local news. You might see us on social media like Facebook. You might see us um, talking to folks at, at local government and tribal meetings and having things put up on flyers in the laundromat. In some of our communities, they're still using CB radio systems for public announcements, and we will make sure we get onto those with public service announcements. So it is, uh, we are flexible, and we want to get that information out and have people report back to us. Um, so that is, again, we are flexible. Yeah, I think that flexibility and I think a few people have touched on meeting people where they're at. I think that's been kind of a common theme of the day. Um, I would like to highlight that I think one of the best ways you can prepare is feedback and sharing your best practices and lessons learned. Uh, every hot wash, or I'm sorry, every exercise ends with a hot wash. Every event, you've got an after action report and meetings like this, having everyone get together and just talk about what everyone else is doing and sharing those best practices. You're using Starlink, great. How much does it cost? What is your service like up in Alaska? Um, will that work for me in BC? So um, with that in mind, I'm gonna hand over to you guys. And this is your turn. I think we've got a great panel here with some really, really good experience to answer your questions. Uh, we've got mics in the back of the room. So uh, now it's your turn. Um, thank you for all that. Really helpful. It's something we certainly struggle with. Um, so I have a comment and a question. The, the comment, just in terms of the best practices, this was not. This was in Huntington Beach, not a remote location at all. But I think it is consistent with Mr. Anderson's comments about the resources for Puerto Rico and about whoever was mentioning the cow, the cellular on wheels, except Melinda maybe, um, that it, one at a time type usage. We have Osprey as a holding statement. As soon as there's a spill, something significant, we put out message. We know there's a spill, we're responding. We don't know anything yet. If you see oil wildlife, don't pick them up, call the hotline. We put that out first. It was the only phone number for an oil spill with tens of thousands of people who were sold, suddenly aware that there was an oil spill. Everyone was calling the wildlife hotline to volunteer, to get information, to set up an interview, the whole thing. So sequencing the release of information, thinking forward that, Okay, if I if, if we're going to communicate out, make sure that whatever that first number you put out is, everybody can use and can be overwhelmed. So I, I, it's something I think we learned in that last step. Like if we put out the wildlife number, we have to put out uh, some other media availability or some other number, um, so we can say don't use this number unless you're talking about wildlife. So that was my comment. Um, lesson learned there. The question I had is for Starlink, which we're also looking at. If I um, Got it correctly. Um, I think Mr. Moss mentioned it's rapidly scalable that you can expand your bandwidth needs, which the first thing that popped in my mind is, does that mean we can buy like the lowest amount for like ongoing operations and then quickly scale up during an emergency? I just If there's any comments on how that works financially to invest in, in that technology, because we're, we're looking at it as well. Thank you. Um, not not to butt in, but because um, I'd mentioned it, I'll, uh, I'll offer a first thought on that. Uh, so we've been using Starlink um, for just over a year now. And the we got into it for our ships going up to the Arctic uh, in the Beaufort for their summer ice breaking season. Um, obviously, very, very expensive for regular satellite communication and Marsat communication, et cetera, et cetera. And lo and behold, Starlink, low Earth orbit uh, constellation, came up and said, hey, you know, we can give you bandwidth for this amount. And it was extremely competitive. Um, so we've we used that now. Every single Canadian icebreaker going up to the Arctic um, has uh, robust bandwidth. Um, we're now extending that to ships down south. Um, so I, I haven't got a firm comment yet or a firm idea on how 
quickly we can adapt and change that bandwidth but i do know that it is available and we can jump to a different program i my impression is that it's relatively quick from a technical perspective Starlink is what's being used in Ukraine. It's one of the first options that they've had. They've been using it for well over a year. And because of the nature of the work they're doing, uh, the Ukraine has a lot more special forces, rapid movement all over the place. It has given them the capability. So it's definitely meeting their needs. So to give you an idea of what you're looking for, I'm pretty sure it can definitely adapt, but it is definitely what is pretty much the only thing that they've had for uh, the entire length of the conflict going on over there. Um, I can also just add to that for you, uh, because most of us work in the area of preparedness. Um, I like to be prepared. So on my way out here this morning when I was driving, I was listening to a podcast um, about remote communications and response locations. And they they were really focusing on Starlink and um, the, the fact that post-COVID, everyone is very used to being able to plug in remotely. And everyone has gotten used to this virtual response environment where you can be a part of the response no matter where you are. And so he kind of started by talking about this is kind of where everything is going, where you need to have this ability for people to teams in, do teams calls, do remote press conferences. And it's not really an option anymore. This is where we're going. So how do you facilitate that? It's how do you get remote Wi-Fi that has the bandwidth and capability to support those response activities? So he talked about a few different levels of Starlink. Um, but what I wanted to mention is he also highlighted that Osros typically, um, I think he mentioned he had done responses with MSRC and they have their own trailer that they can bring out. So depending on the responsible party who's responding, the Osro can bring out um, portable internet and FEMA also is using Starlink. And he said that you can activate that through your partners at the Coast Guard or the EPA. Um, they can call FEMA and do a, a resource request for, for Starlink to bring that out just as a resource for you. Okay. I wanted to ask Liam, uh, the other technology you mentioned with the inReach, because all of our all of our GPS units have that inReach capability. And I wondered for your remote staff, is that is it enough for the communication you need to do? So um, it has uh, different capabilities from another uh, device we were using prior to that called Spot. Um, and so it was an upgrade on that that we looked at from a cost benefit analysis and also some of the remote capabilities that it could provide us. Um, one of, since it's the two-way communication, um, that's a huge plus for us. And uh, also with the, just the interface alone and the fact that our response officers can, can use their mobile phone through it as well. Um, that was a big, um, a big advantage. I, th I want to say it's only been maybe under six months since we've had them rolled out similar to, um, the Coast Guard there with, uh, with Starlink. Um, so it's, it's early going still, but, uh, the feedback so far has been really positive, especially from an onboarding perspective where, um, you, um, you have a tool for our response officers in remote locations that are it's easy to understand how to use it and uh, to train them on, so. All right, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we're using something that I think is similar to, to in reach. It's uh, called Iridium Go, and it's uh, about it's about this big, about the size of a a track tape maybe. And it just has a little tiny antenna that you flip up and it um, basically turns your, your cell phone into a satellite phone. So it does have the text, email and voice. And then it also has a SOS button and a GPS locator and all that. And you can use it, you know, anywhere as long as you have a clear view of the sky. Wow, Kimberly, you used an eight track 
tape to talk about some of the most cutting edge technology. That's right. That was keep fabulous. It real. Thank you. Exactly what we need toward the end of the day here. I, I just want to, I know we're talking about all these new technology things. Um, I really just want to emphasize on the search and rescue side and the maritime, you know, response type situations. Um, and, and if you're going to need support or rescue, um, the Coast Guard is not fit, outfitted for these. We get these and we fig we stumble through these rescues. Um, but your best bet is if with an EPIRB or a PPIRB at this point in terms of the technology that we possess for an effective rescue. So I, I just really want to emphasize that point. Thank you. And an then e I'll just oh, an e is an emergency. Uh, my gosh, now I'm putting it on the spot in my brain. Uh, emergency position indicating beacon. So it'll give you, it'll send us a position where you are uh, versus the new technology. We will get a small snippet and won't get the full picture of what's going on. And um, what I, I would be remiss if I didn't put this out here also. Um, Starlink is an incredible technology, absolutely wonderful. The problem with it is, is that everyone's using it and it's making the cost go down, but there are talks and, and there is deep concern that the individual at the head of this is not necessarily stable in the sense that one day they're this way, one day they're that, they flip flop and relying that heavily on an individual's company that can move their whims at the speed of a, a, of a light switch can put your your situation in a unique position. So to rely, put your entire response on something like that might not be the best thing to do. And it is a reality. Congress is, um, the ones that are taking it serious are looking at this potential because there have been incidents with the Ukraine war going on of um, flicking a switch and not letting them do certain things that they wanted to do on targets. And if they feel they're wronged in some form or fashion by your company or whatever, you might not be able to get your information across. If this isn't hyperbole, this is very real and very true. And the concern is one person having that much control over a lot of governmental en entities is not a good thing, regardless. Uh, it shouldn't be political, but that is a reality. So before you go looking into this, which again, phenomenal technology, incredible asset, just don't put all your eggs in one basket. And, uh, Derek and Michael, I see your hands are up, but Derek, I think you were first. Um, either way, if I could just offer a thought on that, because I think it's a brilliant point. Um, and to expand on it, we have to be wary of overly relying on good communications in remote areas. If we get all our Gucci kit out there and we've got wonderful uh, upload and download speeds, um, the, the, there's a innate desire for more information. You know, the headquarters back you know, 10,000 miles away will expect um, the, the, the line of sight real-time video, uh, and that can be problematic, and it can interrupt proper decision-making. Um, so by, you know, back in the olden days, we would send a team off and, and use something we called mission command, where the on-scene person in charge you know, had the orders and if communications failed, they knew commander's intent, et cetera, et cetera. I, I still think that is, you know, absolutely key to a success, successful operation. Uh, and we who are back home in headquarters, whether regional or national, have to uh, guard against the overuse of technology that, uh, that you know, might not exist in a day um, due to whatever reasons or can overwhelm the practitioners who are there trying to solve a problem. That's a great point. I actually have in my notes for the session, make sure responders are trained on paper, <laughs> making sure that if all else fails, if your computer doesn't, if you don't have power and you can't use your computer for even a spreadsheet, internet aside, if you are in a remote location and you can't even get your generator working, you got to go back to paper forms. Um, Michael, go ahead. And I would just say more from a functional perspective, sometimes satellite phones can be hitchy. And if you're trying to push files, you can get in that death loop where you get up halfway uploaded, it drops and you have to start all over again. So if you're going to be pushing files and content, make sure you bunker down, get a good strong signal and don't move and get it done incrementally. 
Don't try to load up a bunch of stuff and send it out like a big 10 meg video. Re really think incrementally of what's most important to get it done. Do we have any other questions in the room or online? Meg, did you see any questions online? Nothing online, just a lot of kudos for a great discussion and session. Can you actually, can you read, uh, I saw a really good comment, that the last one from Bill. Yeah, that's, that, that was entertaining. Um, yeah, he, let's see, Bill Marhoffer, U.S. Coast Guard, as Lieutenant Commander Bowis notes, newer, more capable communication hardware systems too often require specially trained operators and ma maintainers. The average field operators and responders don't use this equipment regularly, and its use is a fungible skill gained slowly and lost quickly. That's very good educational uh, comment, but I was referring to his last one about the commander oh, in the oh, field. Oh, sorry. The commander in the field is always right, and the rear echelon is wrong unless proved otherwise, Colin Powell. <laughs> uh, especially when you're remote, you got to rely with the people on the scene. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, thank you guys for sticking around a little bit late, and we'll hand back to Meg to wrap up for the day. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, great day. I don't have much to send you off with, so I just want to say thank you again, especially for coming in person and for those of you who braved the full day online. Um, that's a triumph in its own right. Um, I noted about a survey. We do this annually just to get feedback on the meeting um, registration, how the whole process worked from beginning to end. We really value your feedback. So there's a link in the chat for those that are online and it'll be coming around via email to everyone um, once tomorrow and once again next week. So please get, it's a relatively short survey, just an opportunity to provide any feedback and thoughts for next year and things like that. Um, for those of you that are in the room, we've got a lot of tote bags. Um, I brought them from Bellingham and I would prefer not to take them back. So if you'd like to pick up a tote bag with a logo on it, please do grab, grab one for your significant other child as well. Um, and if the task force members could stick around for a couple of minutes, I'd love to grab a photo and we have a couple of cards to sign. I won't um, try to finagle a whole group photo, but um, for those of, for those of you on the task force, that'd be great. Um, Greg, anything? Thanks all. Yay. Yeah. Okay, that's a wrap.